think the the only follow up, and I, I I don't think it's necessary for as being part of this this initial description, but is the is still the is the essential points map you're talking about. So the the practice side for you describing what you're actively doing. So when you say you're bringing conscious attention to a structure, it makes sense for me because I've I've worked with you. Like, so when you talk about these things, I know what you're talking about. I know like what the experience is of bringing attention to something that didn't have any attention brought to it before. Right. I know the expense, I know the experience of either voluntarily or involuntarily losing a structure, Mm -hmm. you know, something being deconstructed. Yeah. I know like the gradual experience of something being reconstructed. Those are very real for me. I don't know if what you've described so far is going to, I think people have those experiences. I don't know if what you've described so far is going to bring those experiences to mind for people. Mm. Mm. So there's like a very grounded theoretical framework. What the personal side of it is, isn't it's partially there because you, I mean, you're talking, you know, the golf swing is there, right? You've got like people have mechanics of something they've looked at before, Mm. you know, people know like there's some, something about the way they walk that's changed over time, right? Something about, uh, the way they carry themselves that's changed over time, the way they feel about other people's changed over time, mm-hmm. right? The the interpersonal, uh, relational side of it, uh, the way they feel about themselves has changed over time, as far as uh, their sense of self, their image of self, uh, what they think self is, even if they haven't talked about it in these terms. Like there's, our sense of self re- evolves regardless, right? Of what what. Uh, whether or not we bring conscious attention to it. If you were to sit and think about who you were when you were 17 versus who you were when you're 30, there's going to be aspects of that that are almost foreign that seem like somebody else. And that's, that's, there's, there's structure to that. There's structure that's changed in that time. And then, so that's just all on the the individual side, but then on the practitioner client side, you're describing the approach very well as far as like this is what i do uh-huh. right structurally theoretically this is the framework for what's happening in a session uh but something you allude to is that you started bringing conscious attention to these structures and there's still and i know it's like the practice 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 is is what what did that for you but i think the more you can like the stretching thing you did the other day as far as like bringing conscious attention to one of these trauma spots, right? And like what that Mm -hmm. uh, practice is for you. Also trying to describe what that practice is as far as these um, essential structures. And by practice, you're saying kind of a a person's individual practice with themselves? I think more, I mean, that's one part of it, but I think in the context of the dimension approach, it's like your practice, like your, you know, professional practice with clients. Like, how are you, if the goal, one of the goals has been to teach people how to do it, right? How would you start to do that with these structures? So if I'm, if I'm understanding the correct, the question, uh, the initial thing is, is discerning conscious attention from ego perception, right? And I can't remember if I said this before, but I have a training program and the first time I I did the program, which was I think in 2015, it was a 81 hour training program. It was nine weekends, three hours on a Friday, and then six hours on a Saturday, and then it was once a month. So we do this, you know, this one weekend a month that was a nine hour deal. The idea was the three hours on the Friday were largely lecture, and then the six hours on the Saturday were largely practice and demonstration. And, and the reason I'm bringing that up is I, I had the syllabus and the, the first weekend was about discerning conscious attention from ego perception. And, and then the second weekend was, was starting to dive into various structures and talking about ego structure and talking about subtle structure and talking about relational dynamics and talking about the physical body. And I was really excited about this syllabus, you know, and, and we, <laughs> after the first weekend, when I started to try to go into the, you know, into getting into specific structures, it just became real obvious that people were still trying to understand this idea of conscious attention versus ego perception. 
And to make a long story short, the whole 81 hours, the whole nine months, we never got past that first, that first uh, item on my syllabus, which was, which was about consciousness versus ego perception. How did they, how did they feel about that? I mean, <laughs> you know, it, everyone really, as, as far as I know, it was, it was a big success, you know, uh, but, <laughs> and, and, you know, and I did a fair amount of talking about the other structures, but, but it definitely was still back to, to that. And people were frustrated with themselves, maybe, maybe frustrated with me, but it didn't seem, you know, seem more like they just, you know, it was like, am I getting it or am I not getting it? You know, and mm. and which I understand. Uh, and it's one of those things where even when a person is orienting from conscious attention, that knowing you're doing it is a different story. So, as far as your question, there's definitely that turning point where someone starts to actually actualize consciousness, conscious attention from just an, an ego state of perception. And, and so doing that, I start with, okay, whatever the thing is, let's say it's an experience they're having in their body or it's an idea or it's a person or, or whatever the object of attention is, <clears throat> I'll say, okay, let's just look at that for a minute. And of course, you know, initially it might be, well, what, like, what do you mean? What do you mean? Let's look at it. I just, you know, I just told you about it. Or, and it's like, okay, right. But, you know, and it's that, you know, what a lot of people would say is let's meditate on that. Let's, let's, let's contemplate, you know, about that. Let's sit and witness it, witness it. Right. And, and what I'm meaning is, is that same thing. It's frustrating when a person doesn't, isn't practiced at that or doesn't have a real clear understanding of that. It's also frustrating if it's something that you have resistance to, right? So, mm an experience of frustration will often come up, even if you're very practiced at it. Initially, it, it, it's, it's starting to develop with the client an awareness of that process and an awareness of what's the difference between cognitively orienting to something and consciously orienting to something. It's that, it's just like the analogy of, or the, uh, you know, the stereotypical example of the person's in therapy and the therapist sa is saying, well, how do you feel about that? Right. And the, the woman saying, well, you know, my husband's an asshole and it's like, okay, but you know, when he says this or that, how do you feel about it? And it's like, well, I just told you, I think he's an asshole. And it's like, okay, but that's not a feeling like, you know, that's a, that's a statement or a, yeah. you know, and, and that whole thing. Right. And it's like, but can you get in touch with your feelings? And it's like, I told you my feelings. I, you know, I want a divorce. And it's like, that's, and it's that same kind of thing, only it's, can we consciously look at that? You know, and it's like, yeah, because I just think that what, and I'm like, okay, you're thinking again, you know, hmm. and it's okay to think, but that's different than, than if we sit and consciously look at it. And, and so there's a lot of practice of, of getting to where it's like, okay, we're sitting in a certain experience with something and I'll, and I'll do a lot of feedback with the client of, of helping them, you know, do you, you know, do you notice the difference between this state and that state? Or I will, I will, uh, I'll shift like I did the other day, you know, I'll, I'll do an intentional shift and I'll just go real cognitive and, and they'll say, yeah, that, you know, that felt annoying. It felt like you were talking at me. It felt like you didn't see me. It felt like you were just aware of your own, you know, thought stream and, and I'm like, right, you know, exactly. And now when I shift and I, and I bring more of a conscious attention to you, then I do that. And then it's, what does that feel like? And it's like, yeah, that feels way better. And it's like, okay, that's the shift I'm talking about, you know? And okay, and then they get a little more of an idea and we practice it. And then it's, it's okay, now can we bring that back to your husband? And let's just say the general idea of your husband, you know? And it's like, what happens? And a lot of times they'll notice that I start leaving conscious tension. I start going right into a, just this ego perception. And it's like, exactly. And so when a person starts to notice that phenomenon, right, or that process or that occurrence, it's like, okay, well, that's the whole game. And then it's, okay, whatever the thing is, whatever the structure, whatever the experience, whatever the object 
it's like, oh, can you tell that you have trouble consciously holding that? And of course, some some people, you know, are be- are better at it than others, or more able to do it than others. Some are more practiced at it. But again, the stuff that we're really struggling with, we we that's what we have trouble doing. I mean, you know, I talk about this stuff all day, every day, but I have my stuff that I can't consciously hold. And if you try to show it to me, if you can see it and you start to bring conscious attention to it and then try to get me to look at it, what you're going to get from me is defense. Right. And then I hopefully I'll be able to notice, oh yeah, you're right. I'm defending. I must be because I want to kill you right now, you know? (laughs) Right. Right. And I didn't want to kill you 10 seconds ago. (laughs) It might and be maybe, a defense. And maybe, maybe that's not you. <laughs> right. And we only have so many like pre-recorded reactions <laughs> right. to, uh, to that defense feeling. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's the, you know, and I'll say, I'll use the phrase that's textbook with clients a lot. And I'm meeting it as a validation of like, right. y- you're not a freak. That's what the, the human ego tends to come with. But sometimes it feels invalidating because it's it's an affront to their specialness or it's a, or, it, or uh, it seems disempowering or something. And I guess, it, I guess it's supposed to be in a certain way, but it, it's like, they say, you know, oh, I, you know, I want to kill myself. And it's like, it's like, right. You know, so do Super I. Super normal. Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> What's your point? Like, it's like, yep. Check. Okay, good. We're, that's the next place we needed to get to. But but it's kind of exciting when you recognize that we, we take it so personally. You know, the fact that we have aggression towards our loved one or we have we think that we're you know, this this bad thing and it's and, and it's and it is quite liberating when you can start to understand that no, that's that's what's there in everyone's human psyche when you when you dig down to that level of depth. Right. I kind of veered off course there, but no, I think that was, I mean, that's, that's right in line. I feel like that's a good contextualization. Cause again, it's not, it's tough, right? Cause that, that shift you're talking about from cognitive ego perception to conscious attention is, is, uh, is a difficult shift. And then it's even once you experience it once it's fleeting or it's, it's, uh, it's so context specific, like you're saying, whether or not you can shift into that and out of your defense reaction or out of your uh, ego structure yeah. or to witness your ego structure in the midst of, of it running its course. Right. And it's, yeah. none, none of it happens quickly, right? There's no, there's like, you get like a breath of fresh air one time when it happens and then. 12 times later, you're like, Oh yep. I, there it is again. You know, yeah. The, right. The only thing more fleeting and, and frustrating than that is golf. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you hit the ball and you go, there it is. That's how you, that's how you hit a golf ball. And then it's gone. That that example makes more sense now. Okay. <laughs> and now I get why the uh the frustration that I'm hearing right. is is uh is an existential frustration, not at all specifically tied to golf. That's right. That's right. Right. Yeah, because when you hit the golf ball right, you feel like a god. <laughs> and then it's pulled away from you immediately. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like uh, it's a bipolar exercise. <laughs> no doubt, no doubt. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's a it's a good point. Obviously, that it's yeah, it's it's the the whole game, if you will, me, not meaning golf, but the game of of bringing conscious attention to something. Like you said, it's it's. Uh, I mean, it's an art. It's a. It's certainly not some kind of linear process, and it's not some kind of. Uh, thing that that if you just will harder it's a practice in will it's a practice in surrender it's a practice in 
discernment. It's a practice in tolerance. It's a practice in recognizing and acceptance. admitting, yeah, acceptance, recognizing limitation. And, and, and not just that, I mean, it's in a, in a practice in owning power, a practice in recognizing the, the, the depth and the richness and the actuality of yourself as well. So, and and, it, and in, in facing paradox. I was having a conversation with Sky the other day and I was just saying, she was asking how I felt about something. I was like, I feel this way. And if something happened, I would feel this way. And, uh, and I was like, and both of those things are true. Like both of them are very true. And she was like, I, you know, I've appreciated learning that, that two things can be true at the same time. And I was like, that's, <laughs> I was just the nicest thing I'd heard. <laughs> it was just a sweet, <laughs> a sweet idea. But, the that the, the, the paradox you're talking about, that the facing paradox and accepting paradox and that the, the, the imagined conflict is a structure right? The, yeah. the diametric opposition is a structure and that's uh that's a real like wisdom tradition thing that's always been, been around, but right. The, the truth of conscious attention exists outside of imagined opposition or imagined conflict. That's again, that gets specific to certain, certain things. Obviously there are things that are opposed or things like they're, Sure. The the whole layers of truth, but um, yeah, but that you know, I think the next big topic, or whatever, does not the next one necessarily, but where I hear you going right there is is from from structure to dialectic, mm. because opposites, th- this idea of a dialectic, which I think we should do a whole episode on, uh, and I can't remember how much we've talked about, you know the. Dialectic. I think it's misunderstood largely. People tend to when they hear dialectic, most people don't have don't know that word, but if they do know the word, they'll think Hegel and they'll think synthesis and or I'm sorry, thesis, antithesis, and then synthesis. So so the idea that that you take two opposites and then you you somehow integrate them or combine them into a synthesis, right? But that's not what a dialectic is, as far as I understand. A dialectic is not an integration. It's not a homogenizing. It's not a compromise. The idea with a dialectic is that it somehow, paradoxically, is both and. And that the truth of it is that it's one. It is, it is one thing that contains both. So the yin-yang symbol... The idea is that absolute yang exists and absolute yin exists and simultaneously they are one thing, right? So again, it's not gray. It's not that the whole world is gray. It's that there is absolute white and absolute black and everything in between. And the rational mind, the way our cognitive rational ego mind is is built it doesn't operate that way. We just, that, that's not how it, mm-hmm. it operates. And, and what I mean by that is, is I think in a structural way, the ego mind is not structured to, to experience that way. And so when and we... That, that ties into the, our whole discussion of the first through or third chakra development too, just that right. there is this development over and against other defining self in terms of what is and is not related to other or is and is not representative of other. And then there is like the step away from that as a step out of ego and back towards. Yeah. Uh, and initially, you know, hopefully paradox, but. Right. Yeah. And that this third thing shows up, right. Se- seemingly third thing. If you take if, if, like a switch, right? It, it, it's like if you disconnect the switch or if the switch is, and I keep trying to get my lingo correct on this as far as electricity, um, and, and it's a whole other topic, but, but the, the, not too long ago, I learned that one of the most profound inventions or discoveries of the 20th century was the ability to have a, a switch where for example, and, and I can't remember all the correct terminology, but prior to this discovery, you didn't have the ability to have a machine 
shut off when it, when it got to be too hot, for example. They developed this technology to where if an engine started to overheat, it would shift into a mode where it would cool off, right? And now we just think of that as commonplace. You know, you have your, uh, you know, your thermostat in your room, right? It's like it, the temperature gets to a certain point and then boom, it shuts off so that it doesn't just keep getting hotter and hotter and hotter, right, in your room. And same with the air conditioning. But that was a technology that didn't exist until, you know, very recent human history. Hmm. Uh, so anyway, it comes into play in the, in the human mind where we, we throw the switch. And, and I've used that analogy a lot in trying to describe trauma. The trauma is when we throw the switch. It's when the circuit breaker disconnects so that the charge cannot move through that area. With regard to a dialectic, it's that thing where it's like, okay, if you if you you have a light bulb, right, in your lamp, let's say, and it's like when you allow the circuit to come together, when you allow it not to be a duality, right? When you allow a continuous circuit to happen, the light bulb turns on, right? And with the invention of the light bulb, it was like that was a miracle. And so if we sort of take that idea that, oh my God, the you know, the light bulb lighting up like that is some kind of spiritual, you know, equivalent, right? It's like, yeah, but the light bulb goes out. You extinguish that magical, wonderful, you know, thing that, that is light and all the, all the things that, that being able to produce light like that has done for mankind. All you got to do is disconnect the circuit and it goes out. No matter how many, you know, volts or watts or how important that light was or whatever. It's like, well, if you cut the if you cut the circuit, the the light just sort of disappears. Mm. Right? It's a it's a it's a strange thing. Even just the light in your room. It's like you just go over and you flip this little switch and the whole room goes dark. We take it for granted, but it's like it's a pretty big deal. And and we live by it. You know, we are literally in the dark when you shut the light out and it, it's the same way with consciousness in our own experience of ourselves of others of life at any given moment it's like the lights on or the lights off and of course there's degrees of it right but i'm but if we just say lights on or lights off I'm, i mean it's massive it's it's more it's more profound than if the actual lights are on or off in the environment you're in and we don't, what's really hard is we don't realize it. And that's a part of what I'm trying to talk about with, with the dimension approach stuff is we won't even know it. I mean, if you're, if you're walking around your room and the lights go out and suddenly uh, you run your leg into the coffee table, you know, it's like, you know, what's going on. It's like, well, the lights went out. I couldn't see, you know, and the reason my shin hurts so bad is because I ran into the, it, but we wander around life having the light go on and off and we don't even know it. And so we experience all this stuff and, and then we come up with all these explanations and all these defenses and all these accusations or whatever. And, and the work I'm doing and it, and it's, you know, it's a simplification, but it's like, I, I'm, I'm trying to sort of put that paradigm forth and, and help people recognize that the stuff you're dealing with, again, whether it's a physical malady or, or that you're, you can't, perform an activity correctly or terrible depression, it comes back to, is the light on or not? Is there consciousness there or not? Because when there's consciousness, you feel in, in real simplified terms, everything's okay with consciousness. Everything is not okay with ego. Mm. Now there's ego, you could say there's positive ego experiences and stuff, but, but if, you, if you get down into it or whatever, even so-called positive experience, if they're purely ego experiences, they, they are devoid of actual meaning. They're devoid of actual satisfaction. They're devoid of actual truth. And so it, it really gets down into this very either or black and white dualistic situation between light and dark consciousness or unconsciousness. And then this idea of the dialectic is that, is that it's not about a mix of light and dark. Right, you always hear people say, "Well, if there wasn't the dark, then you couldn't have the light, and if there wasn't the pain, you couldn't have the pleasure." And so, you know, that makes it all okay. And what a lot of people will tell you is, "Well, that doesn't make it okay to me." 
You know, like I'm not satisfied with that explanation. But a deeper explanation, a more profound one, is this idea of a dialectic, an idea that when you allow the two different sides to come together, for example, that you split in your ego mind because of trauma, when you allow them to come together, the light comes on. And the light is consciousness. And consciousness, what you discover, actually contains those two seemingly different elements within it. And so instead of consciousness being a third thing or consciousness being something that, you know, that happens, you know, it's again, the light bulb analogy works well because it's like this little, what do they call it? A flint or, or that little wire in the light bulb. Uh, filament. Filament. You know, it's this little teeny thing encased inside this glass bulb, right? And then you're standing outside of that bulb, you know, and it's like, what the hell is that little teeny thing in there going to do for me? And it's like, it lights up and suddenly your whole world has changed, right? And you recognize that the light that seems to be radiating from that light bulb, it's filling the room. You know, now suddenly that little, the light is not only in front of you, in that little filament that you're looking at, but the lights behind you, the lights above you, the lights below you, it's all around. And again, I'm making an analogy, but it's like that with consciousness. It's like consciousness shows up and you recognize that it's all existing within the consciousness. And that the seeming duality of it wasn't the, wasn't the underlying truth. The underlying truth was a unity of consciousness and the duality mm-hmm. exists within that unity. Because the duality you you have to overcome, like a duality, like you have to pick, pick one, right? I mean, that's the the struggle. That's right. the you talk about because I think what your example is great. Just the the language around you can't appreciate peaks without valleys, or uh, just all of those those like pat you on the shoulder and move on, right? Words the. The truth is that both of those, like you're saying, exist within a larger container and you're, you're on, it's, it's like, uh, I mean, in Sufism veils between you and truth, right? That you can, that is, that is one veil that is, is removed to think that you only need to seek good and you can't appreciate having both. Right. So, I mean, that's, that is a degree closer to truth, but the truth that, Beyond that is like you're saying that that both of those exist and that you're still along for a ride that you're unaware of if you think that one helps define the other, recontextualize the other. It's like, no, both exist within this larger container that can actually allow for them and accept them in a way that uh, rebranding them is never going to yeah. uh, help. or <laughs> Right. I think you put it, put it well. And that's a, it's, again, it's a shift to non-rational. It's spiritual, it's esoteric, it's mystical. It's, it's like the quantum idea. It's, it's like you, you know, it jumps off the, the normal track. Yeah. Describing it as a state change. Right. So everything gets like a little like cross-eyed trying to, totally. to say it. But, but, but kind of on that note, again, the reason with the dimension approach, another aspect of it that I think is important is it's coming at this stuff from the other direction, so to speak. And what I mean by that is you can try to resolve the duality. You can try to accept the duality. You can try to accept limitation or accept loss, or you can try to have an ego death, or you can try to deconstruct ego structures, et cetera, et cetera. And those are all Things that happen, those are all valid and have their place. But the progression, if you will, is that you, things get worse and worse, darker and darker. They move more and more towards, towards the unconscious, which means more and more towards, uh, you know, darkness and badness and death and, and horror. And eventually, if you can get past that, they lead to nothing, which can seem even worse. And then eventually you can, you, you, there starts to be an emergent light, an emergent sense of beingness, an emergent sense of, 
of consciousness. And th- that's, that's a progression that's sort of going, going in a certain direction. What I'm saying with the dimension approach, and again, this is, is something that everyone's doing or not doing to varying degrees, you're bringing in consciousness as the first step. You meaning either for yourself or for someone else. And, and then you're saying, okay, you know, we're going to provide as ground consciousness and now go through that process, go through that process of, you know, the suffering and the death and the surrender and the release and the, you know, whatever. But what a shaman does, for example, is the shaman shows up as a conscious presence and then walks through that process with you. And so in that regard, you know, I'm, I'm not... I'm not talking about doing anything different than what the shaman does. And it and I'm not doing anything different than what the, you know, what most what we all try to do for our loved ones, etc. It's like, okay, you know, you you intentionally show up as consciousness and then every every step of the way you're being a conscious presence and then relating from that conscious presence in various ways. The reason it's not just that, the reason I'm saying there's this, there's this approach and there's this methodology and whatever, is, and again, I'm just trying to distill down the existing ones, is that it's like, okay, certain kinds of conscious presencing, certain kinds of focusing conscious attention, certain kinds of, fo- of conscious relating have their application to certain phases of that process. And, and so there's a real science to that because showing up with conscious presence in the wrong way can actually be quite harmful. Not showing up in the right way can be quite harmful. It's a huge thing. And we all, human relating, you know, it's like in psychology, there's an understanding that, that in human relating, to experience empathic failure from an other makes us lose our shit. And, it, and it's, I mean, it's extremely powerful. When, when we have the experience that the other is not empathically in tune with us, it, I mean, there's potential for really bad things to happen, really bad feelings, really bad behavior, because we, it, it's like, our, again, our minds are structured that way. And even just in the moment, it's like you and I sitting here, you in San Francisco, me in Minneapolis, all this history we have, all these experiences we've been through, the, this tremendous resonance and trust and and whatever but it's like at any given moment we could get on some topic and be saying something and then and if it hits a spot where it feels like hey you're not empathically attuned to what i'm saying right now it, it's like there's potential for it at least in the moment to just feel like fuck you i'm done I'm never talking to you again right just become alien yeah and it sucks it's a, it sucks <laughs> you know that that's the way it works <laughs> Right. (laughs) But having an understanding of that can help at least help with the repair after that's happened. It's, it's like this unconscious concern about having your intention recognized. Yes. That's yeah. I mean, that's breakdowns in every relationship. (laughs) Yes. And it's an important point you just made that it's not just, Hey, I need to be empathized with. It's when you feel that you're in, that your intention is being misunderstood. If you want to learn more about the Dimension Approach, please visit dimensionapproach.com. 